Once again, we're at the restoration hangar of the San Diego Aerospace Museum at Gillespie Field in El Cajon, California. Our guest today is Jack Walker, Jack Johnny Walker, who was a P-38 pilot in World War II. First of all, tell our viewers why they called you Johnny Walker. Well, my father uh, named me John, and uh, he called me Johnny for years. And then I got, when we moved to Southern California, I got kind of weary of that. And I says, Mother, let's go to Jack. And Mother says, I think so, too. So uh, I just once in a while throw the Johnny in to uh, have people not forget my name. <laughs> well, there's a, a famous name, Johnny Walker. It has to do uh, with a liquid refreshment. Yes, and people always say, is that red label or black label? Johnny Walker. Yeah. Uh, it's an alcoholic refreshment. Uh, which uh, pilots have never uh, never indulged, indulged in. Never, you know, never, never indulged in that. Oh. Um, let's talk about the beginnings of the Lockheed Lightning P-38 in uh, 1937 with Germany's rearmament. The War Department issued uh, specifications for a high-speed interceptor plane, but because of its uh, requirements of a 350 mile an hour speed, most people didn't think that such a plane was possible. Um, a man named uh, Kelly at Lockheed. Kelly Johnson. Kelly Johnson. Who has uh, just died, by the way. Kelly Johnson uh, had a new concept. Would you tell our viewers about that new concept? Well, the idea was a twin boom, twin engine fighter, with the pilot in the middle of it in a cell. And you could put all the armament in a cell, put the pilot, and the engines were outboard of the pilot. The uh, pod. It had a pod, it had in, the a pod in the middle. And it was a tricycle gear, which was kind of revolutionary for fighters, and a beautiful flap called a Fowler flap. Now, first of all, in order to come anywhere near 350 miles an hour, it had to be a twin. Yes. But uh, twins are not very maneuverable. No, they weren't. So his new concept of a twin boom uh, was the radical departure from what was normal. Yes along with a uh, wheel, uh, rather than a joystick, a wheel. That's right. Instead of uh, a, a joystick or a stick control, it had a wheel. It had a wheel. But um, it had counter-rotating propellers. Counter-rotating propellers. And uh, what was the other thing you mentioned, a flap? It was a Fowler flap. But, uh, it was a new uh, idea in flaps. I think it was on the Hudson bomber first. Yes, so they made the Hudson yeah. bomber first. So it gave the P-38 incredible uh, performance and landing and then the pattern nice and slow for a big twin engine fighter it was a large fighter and the flap let it uh, come in and land at yeah, slower quite, speeds quite slow speed mm -hmm. okay but before we start about the production of the airplane uh, there was something that took place called compression would you tell our viewers about that well they had a had a, a problem I believe it started in the um, in the wind tunnels in which, uh, incidentally, the Germans were having the same problem at the same time we were. And, uh, of course, we didn't know about it. He, no, no people spent letters back and forth in those days with the war started. And uh, they were concerned about it, and they came around to all the flying schools and, and told the pilots, don't get the nose down too steeply with too much speed. And, uh, and then they had a terrible crash at Burbank where one of the chief test pilots who dove it to find out about compressibility and the tail came off and he crashed in Glendale. So that time they had to do some re-engineering. Uh, and as I understand it, it was the wing fillets that fit in the front of the leading edge of the wing that caused the um, airflow to burble mm -hmm. over, the, over the airplane. It had a serious buffeting effect. Buffeting effect. And, and uh, in a dive, it would reach such proportions that it would shake the tail off? Oh, you couldn't hold the wheel. It was just uh, a lot of young pilots and experienced pilots, including myself, <laughs> got into it until they put a placard on there. Do not dive this beyond a certain speed. Well, they started production uh, with the... Uh, oh, no, wait a minute. Uh, before they started production, they had only one of them. Mm -hmm. And you said that you lived near Lockheed. That's in Pasadena. And uh, at this particular time, uh, there were isolationists in Congress. And to free up some money for the military budget for this airplane, 
they decided to have a transcontinental flight. Yes. Would you tell our viewers about that? Well, that was a, uh, uh, to convince the Pentagon uh, that they, Lockheed, being very young and very new, that they had, had something uh, real great, they decided to go across the country for a record speed with a, a young lieutenant called Ben Kelsey. And they took off from March Field, which, by the way, has our new P-38 museum there at March. And uh, he made, uh, I think it was you told me, two refueling stops? Yes, he made a refueling stop at Amarillo yeah. and at Wright Field. Two stops. And those two stops cost him one hour's time. Mm -hmm. And I believe as he approached, I think it was Mitchell, he was to land at Mitchell. Uh, there's been a lot of speculation over this, and I read a couple of books, but uh, I think he got caught out in the pattern there and pulled the power way back, and they, the uh, engines wouldn't recover, and he had a belly end short of the runway on a golf course. But it didn't seem to face the Pentagon. They went ahead and, uh, due to the figures from uh, March Field to uh, that golf course, that they, they gave uh, Lockheed a contract. Uh, even with the two stops, which added an hour to the time, he flew it in seven hours and 42 minutes. Yeah, and that was how far? 2,000? 2,400 2, miles. 400 miles. So uh, that was very impressive. Very impressive for that time. So the Pentagon ordered 80 airplanes, and uh, would that have been, since it was the second one, it would have been the B or C model, I guess, if I'm they not, ordered. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I flew in the, uh, the D, E, and the F, and the G. Well, the, the contract that they let for that uh, specified that it had to have a 20 millimeter cannon and four 50 caliber um, machine guns. guns. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of armament did you have in the D model? Well, we had a, a glass plate in front of us and a large armor plate behind us uh, in, the, in the D model. Now, that was um, to protect the pilot because in, in yeah. the United States, pilots were not Kleenex. Uh, in Japan and Germany, pilots were expendable. Yes. Uh, use them all up. Uh, Japan had 14-year-old boys flying at one time. Uh, their first solo was their last flight. But uh, to protect the American pilot, uh, they had the armor plate installed around the cockpit and a special plexiglass, almost bulletproof. Almost bulletproof. Mm -hmm. And that was on the D model? It was on the D model. It might have been the earlier model, too. I mean, I'm not sure of the... But by the Army D model, figures. you had Oh, yes, definitely. Within a month after they, uh, they uh, started building, they had uh, almost doubled uh, the armament, not in guns, but, but uh, in, ammo. in the amount of ammunition ammo. and so forth that ammo. they could carry. They had early trouble with the cannons. Uh, they used to uh, uh, lock up, fire one or two shells and lock up, but they, they finally solved that problem. Now, England ordered... Um, I think 300 or something like that airplanes and because it had this General Electric supercharger mm -hmm. uh, we delivered them uh, the Lightnings, uh, the Lockheed Lightning P-38 without the supercharger, a less powerful engine. Yes. Would you tell our viewers about that? Well the British had high hopes for the airplane but above uh, I believe is a figure uh, between 12 to 15 thousand it just died and uh, it didn't have any uh, performance. So uh, on that basis, and at that time, uh, for ground support, I don't think they thought a big twin engine airplane was going to be good enough, and they just canceled the order. Well, they received three mm -hmm. uh, with the lesser-powered engine, and uh, the British were the ones who nicknamed it the Lightning. The Lightning, yes. The British didn't like the uh, underpowered engine, and after receiving only three airplanes, uh, they changed the name. To a castorated uh, P-38. <laughs> and they canceled the order. Canceled the order. So we still had uh, 140 of them in production at that time. What became of those? Well, they were put out for training, and uh, uh, even down at uh, Luke and Williams Air Force Base in Arizona, they checked the young, brand-new pilots out in those early P-38s to give them some sp uh, specific time. Let's talk about the training and checking them out. Uh, there were two methods. One was to put an instructor in the left pod, the left boom, and the other one was to remove uh, all the radio equipment and, and put an instructor piggyback in, the back. piggyback in the back. Would you tell our viewers about those two methods? Well, I didn't. I've never seen a photograph of that boom. 
situation where instructors are out there. But in my checkout at uh, Edwards uh, Dry Lake up in the uh, desert, where it was a big checkout period up there, uh, he just laid on the wing, the instructor, and I went through a, a single engine procedure and emergency procedures and said, stay up for about 35, 40 minutes and then, then come on back. And that was the checkout, pat you on the back and let you go. So when you soloed, uh, you, you were in the plane all alone. All alone, uh-huh. But later, uh, rather than turn a, a, a comparatively inexperienced pilot loose with this very complicated airplane, uh, they, they removed the radio equipment and put the instructor piggyback in the back. Yes. Gave him a good check ride, and you could uh, hear the instructor talking, and he'd show you things, and you'd watch, and he'd single engine, which was the biggest uh, uh, item of, of, of a checkout, was single engine on the P-38, and show you how to do it, and uh, and you were much more confident than when I was uh, taking off from that desert with my feet <laughs> shaking on the rudder pedals. Well, it was a very complicated airplane to fly. The uh just the regular pilot didn't fly it. It took a special pilot to fly the P-38. I never knew how they selected them. Uh, I'm sure that uh, the training schools, uh, uh, my group, all went through twin-engine training. So we had sync, we had twin-engine training before we got there. But a lot of single-engine pilots did check out the P-38, and they didn't have too much trouble. But they had a criteria for selecting yes. the pilots. It wasn't, they didn't just grab anybody. No, they didn't. It, it was a special no. airplane yeah. and required a yeah. special pilot. Yes. Also, the maintenance crews had to be special. Oh, very special. Uh, because uh, with it being a twin, it was twice as much maintenance, and uh, they had to protect the supercharger, and they cannibalized and protected the parts. And they had a special school, uh, Illinois had a special school, and Glendale, California had a special school that I'm sure Lockheed was involved in, and the Allison engine people were involved in to train the mechanics. We had excellent ground crews, just excellent. Now, the three main qualities of the uh, P-38 was uh, excellent uh, climb ratio, uh, long distance range, and the safety of being a twin engine. Come home on, on one, one engine. Uh, they were delivered to England in June of 1940, and uh, did you deliver the first group, or you were among the first group that delivered not, some? Not really. The first group tried to fly over on the northern route, and it was disastrous, and most people have read about the Greenland uh, unbearing of the P-38s, you know, when they, uh, when they all belly landed in Greenland, along with the B-17s. Uh, and so they canceled that. I don't know. It's called Operation Bolero, I think. And then we all went over by boat, and they had a large factory at Belfast, Langford Lodge, where they put P-38s together. And that's where I picked mine up. In my, uh, so we were the uh, third P-38 group over there. And you delivered a P-38 to somebody uh, whose name uh, is recognizable. Oh, you remember that, huh? Yeah. Elliot Roosevelt, President yeah. Roosevelt's son, yeah. Elliot. Yes, I delivered it in Algiers, uh, a photo Freddy, the photo airplane. That was the photo recon. Photo recon, had oh, light cameras and no guns. And uh, on the way down, uh, I had an unfortunate incident. I uh, made an inexperienced pilot's mistake and crashed in Wales. <laughs> but I did recover and, uh, and finally got uh, another airplane and, and got down and delivered it to Elliot Roosevelt in, uh, in Algiers. Uh, the P-38s were delivered to Northern Africa at a time when they were really needed to escort the bombers into Germany. And we'll talk about that when we come back from this very important message. Theater. Today, our guest is Jack Walker, who was a P-38 pilot in World War II. Now, the P-38s were delivered to North Africa when they were really needed as bomber escorts because the 8th Air Force was taking a shellacking at the hands of the Messerschmitts and the Falk Wolfs. But uh, when they were used as bomber escorts, they didn't have the high altitude capability that was really needed uh, which the Mustangs later came along and mm -hmm. fulfilled. 
Uh, so they were used for ground attack. Would you tell our viewers about their success in ground attack? Are we, are we talking about the North African theater? No, in Europe. Oh, in, in England. Mm -hmm. Well, the first fighter group uh, was the one that was going to go into combat first. And I believe they flew two or three missions in England. And then uh, because of Operation Torch, the uh, invasion of North Africa went rather badly. All three groups, 1st, 14th, and 82nd, were ordered immediately to Africa and pulled away from the 8th. So the 8th had no fighter, uh, fighter support except uh, Spitfires and Hurricanes. And uh, that's where I started, uh, from Ireland. My group uh, picked up our airplanes and flew down. So after the North African campaign, the P-38 started flying uh, bomber protection. Uh, no, they, they did start them in North Africa, uh, bombing Berserti in Sicily. I know a song about that. Dirty Gertie. Dirty Gertie from Berserti, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they did uh, do some high altitude uh, missions in North Africa. And most of it was B-26 medium bombers and B-25 sea uh, sweeps and fighter sweeps uh, over Tunisia. For and, the, uh, and then after North Africa, they started escorting and, uh, uh, bombers uh, into Germany. Into the heavies. Mm -hmm. And uh, they didn't really achieve the success that uh, was hoped for. Their real success came in ground attack. Yes, later on uh, when uh, the Mustang got fully operational. They moved a lot of the P-38s to ground attack. And then they were devastating. Yes. I, I've seen uh, film of them blowing up ships. And trains. Yeah. And convoys. And I only I only went uh, twice on, on ground attacks twice. Didn't like it. Didn't like it. I'd rather be up high uh, mixing it with the ME-109s. <laughs> That's true, because uh, one soldier with a rifle could bring you could down. bring you down. Bring you down low. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the later models, uh, or other models. You mentioned the uh, Photo Recon. That was Photo Freddy. Photo Freddy. Uh, it had no guns. No guns. Uh, it was all cameras. All camera. And usually went unescorted uh, to do their photo work. Uh, Relying simply on their speed and, and stealth. And their speed and their stealth. And I think they, they had pretty heavy losses. Um, I've read that um, the Photo Recon P-38s, without a single gun or bomb, saved more lives than any other aircraft in World War II. I, I assume that's uh, correct. Because of the photo information that they brought, they brought back. They brought back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, um, tell us about the one that was painted bright orange. Oh, the Yippie? Yippie. Mm -hmm. Now, that was number what? One thousand? Five. Five, five thousand. thousand. That was number five thousand, the Yippie. And, of course, that was kind of a uh, Tony Levere, the chief test pilot Lockheed, kind of his private mount. And I don't think he raced that at Cleveland. I think he raced it somewhere. I can't remember where the air race was. But it was, was used for publicity oh, yes. to promote the fact that they had made 5,000 of yes. them. In fact, during World War II, they made almost 10,000. Almost, just under. 9,640 or something like that. We had eight or nine left and just a few flying. Um, also, they had what they called the night fighter. That, that was an unusual that bird. They right? painted black. I've only seen pictures of that. The M? Yes, the, the M, M model. M model. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, it had radar. There were two people in that one. Two in uh, that. They had a radar operator back where the instructor sat piggyback, and uh, it was used towards the end of the war. Uh, probably another more interesting one was uh, developed by Sherman Williams Paint Company. Oh, the uh, the coloring. The, the coloring, uh, 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 it was uh, uh, It was called a haze blue. Haze blue. Oh. And uh, at uh, at high altitude, difficult to see. It was it almost invisible. It just sort of blended in. Um, after Germany surrendered, uh, the P-38s fought in the Pacific Theater and were devastating against the Japanese oh, planes. Oh, excellent! That uh, that was the altitude the 38 really loved. Uh, they, where most of their uh, dogfighting took place, the medium altitudes. That's why Major Richard Bong was so successful. He yeah. shot down 40. With these 40 kills. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about you for a little bit. Uh, when and where did you get started in flying? I guess we, we'll start with Pasadena, when I was very fortunate to, to find out that President Roosevelt was going to start a civilian pilot training program. And I rushed down in a junior college at Pasadena and got into that program. Uh, you went to Pasadena City College? A junior College. Junior College. Yeah, City College now, I think. That's where the Rose Bowl Queen comes from, Yes, it? yes. Yeah. They always pick the Rose Bowl Queen out of that particular uh, college. And uh, 
well, I went to Alhambra Airport and trained on uh, light planes, little cubs like we see around here. And then I went into the secondary program where they were going to make an instructor out of me. In the meantime, I had felt that I wanted to be uh, on active duty if I was going to get called up. I was going to end up carrying a rifle. So I uh, took the Army Air Corps exam and uh, passed and went into training at Santa Maria, California. At were the, you at Stearman? At Stearman, the Alan Hancock School of Aeronautics, who's very famous at the University of Southern California with, with his donations of money, Hancock Oil Company. Oh, yes, Hancock Oil Company. Mm -hmm. um, so you uh, took your basic training in a steerman, moved into an AT-6, I guess? No AT-6s. We had twin-engine Bobcats. Uh, oh, was that right? Cessnas at Stockton, California. And most of us in that class were uh, taken to P-38s, and the other group went down to uh, Luke Air Force Base as instructors in AT-6s. And uh, I, I escaped that fate, <laughs> which was rather a... So instead of becoming an instructor, uh, you went to uh, England? No, I went straight to the Northwest and called the 55th Pursuit Group, brand new, uh, slated for Alaska. Because at that time we had the uh, Dutch Harbor situation. Yes, the Japanese had And I thought, oh boy, we're going to be flying uh, in the weather. You know? mm -hmm. But uh, we were a training group in the 55th. I ended up down, back down at Long Beach in the 82nd Friday Group, and where uh, I went to, um, to uh, on the Queen Mary to England. And after, after you got to England, uh, you delivered some planes to North Africa. Took them down to North Africa. And then, then what duty did you started, We started combat in, in North Africa. Uh, three groups of P-38s. And uh, uh, we were up against uh, some pretty experienced uh, German pilots who, uh, who'd been in uh, Libya. And they'd been down there since 40, 41. And here we were, uh, 40, 1942, you know, against a, uh, a rather seasoned... Uh, uh, German fighter pilot. And I met you before at Bill Allen's museum. Yes. And uh, you told me that the Germans were very, very, very good. <laughs> our losses were high in our group. We had 40, 41% losses in the 82nd mm -hmm. fighter group. Uh, after North Africa, what did you do? Uh, went up to uh, Sicily and Italy, and you had to fly 50 missions to complete your tour of duty and came back to Ontario, California. You flew 50 missions. 50 missions. And you were awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. Distinguished Flying Cross. I had five victories, and I'm probably rare. I'm, I'm known as a two-week ace. They took the five, fifth one away from me because of a non, uh, uh, no film. Uh, my wingman wasn't sure he went in. I wasn't sure he went in. That happened to Ben Drew. Yeah, Ben Hoss won too. Uh, if, uh, so they took that away, and, and unfortunately, they, they sent the news home to the Times, the Examiner, and the passing the paper that I was an ace. So I had to come home. I had to face that barrage of, why aren't you an ace? And so that's the reason. No confirmation, no, no film. No confirmation, no film, and no ground troops. And I thought, sure, over at Anzio, they saw it go in, but uh, they didn't. So, but you finished your 50 missions? 50 missions. And yeah. came back to Ontario, back to, Ontario to do what? To an instructor. And we so had, you got stuck with that anyway. Got stuck with that. At least at P-38, the latest one, the L. The one with the booster and the dive flap and all that. Yes, let's talk about that. They uh, finally corrected the compressionability yes. by putting a special flap on it. Yes, under, the, the, under the wing. Uh, not a very big uh, flap, but uh, enough to pop down and uh, bring the nose back up from the vertical position and get you to recover. And that flap kept the nose from going too far down going too in far a dive down and corrected the compressionability. Beautiful. And, of course, they had... Uh, uh, the uh, power, power steering is what it was called, and uh, made the, uh, the L uh, much more combat susceptible because you could turn that thing. It was very hard to get that P-30 into a turn. You had to crank it around. It took a special pilot. I suppose. <laughs> uh, on the day that uh, the war ended, uh, there was still an order for 2,000 P-38s at Lockheed. And uh, had the war continued, it would have continued to be uh, one of the most popular airplanes. Yes. Yeah. I want to thank you very much for visiting with us today. I salute you for your contributions to aviation and to our country. Thank you, Fred. Thank you very much for having me. Jack Walker, P-38 pilot. As always, this is Captain Fred saying, I love airplanes and I honor the people who fly them.